Good afternoon, Aja. Are you there? Ah, there we go. Okay. So please do uh, start when you're ready, Ajahn. Thank you very much great. for being here. So, uh, excellent. So let us uh, continue where we uh, stopped last time. And uh, just to get myself sorted out a little bit here. Yeah, so I kind of see the right things on the screen. Okay, that's better now. I'm really, I'm really happy now. <laughs> so. Uh, we are uh, looking at this uh, Portalia Sutta from the Majjhima the middle length saying it's a, of the Buddha, number 54. And, and this is one of those few suttas where they talk about uh, the sensory world in quite a bit of detail and with, with all the similes and all the things that we have seen so far. And, and the idea behind this is to, if you like, establish a bit of that view of the Buddha, what you might call right view or right outlook or right attitude or kind of thinking about the world in the way which aligns with how the Buddha saw the world. This is kind of the idea behind this. So, yeah, so it is something to be reflected on. It's not something that you kind of just have to take on uh, on faith or anything like that, but reflect on it and see if it has an effect in your life. That's kind of the purpose of this. So, because all of these teachings, they have a, a gradual effect. You may hear it once, it may make sense to you. You may agree, you probably agree to a lot of these things because they are kind of, I don't know, they, many of them are sort of self-evident, but uh, it takes time for these things to sink in and really have an effect on the mind. So you start to turn in a different direction and you kind of turn around this super tanker of habits and so super tanker of habits kind of charging down at full speed and the momentum is great, it takes a long time to turn it around. And this, uh, what this reflection does over time, it uh, changes the habits gradually, gradually. So you change course and you start to look at the world in a different way. And of course, the purpose of this in the end is to allow you to experience more happiness, less suffering, greater meaning, greater purpose in life, what it comes down to at the end. So um, we just had a look at the uh, simile of the charcoal pit, and uh, I will now move on to the next uh, simile here. This is known usually called the simile of the dream, and uh, this is how the Buddha, what the Buddha says: uh, Suppose a person uh, was to see delightful parks, woods, and meadows, uh, and lotus ponds uh, in a dream, but when they woke up, they couldn't see them at all. And then the Buddha goes on to say that the, uh, uh, the Buddha, the Tathagata, he says that the sensual things of the world, they are similar to a dream. Yeah? And for that reason, we uh, should give up the equanimity based on diversity and move to the equanimity based on unity with all desire for the uh, sensual material objects of the world where they all cease without remainder. Uh, so the sensual world is like a dream, yeah, and it's a kind of fascinating idea. We often talk about, you know, you often hear about, you know, things in the world being like a dream. I don't know, things like the Matrix. I've never seen the Matrix, so but that is certainly where the world is like a kind of artificial creation almost. But this is a bit different from that. This is more like that um, uh, the idea of the world that we have in our mind is different from the reality outside. This is really what this points to. And when you, it's very important to check that. What is our idea of the world? And it's always a glossy kind of idea of reality that we have. Yeah, when you think about the relationship that you want to have, you think about the house that you want to have, you think your new job that you're going to get, it tends to be a glossy idea of these things uh, where they actually are much better than they really are. Uh, but the reality behind the surface is often much more mundane, uh, much more limited, uh, much less satisfying uh, than the glossy picture in our mind. It's like a dream. It's like a non-reality of what things are. Uh, 
And this is so such an important thing to remember. Yeah. And I always think about myself because I think my, my own personal life is a very good example of how badly wrong you can go man, in terms of dreams and things. So, because when I was young, when I was at university, when I was kind of messing around and enjoying myself and playing around in the world of the five sense pleasures, so, I also had an idea about what life would be like. And it was very different from what it turned out to be. I had ideas, you know, about uh, girlfriends and about careers and about houses and about what my life was going to look like and all of these kind of things. Uh, and of course, it became very, very different from that. Uh, and uh, it shows you that our ability to recognize what life actually is like is often so completely, uh, it's so overblown, the ideas that we have compared to the actual reality. So keep that in mind, yeah, when you see the dream of something, a new relationship, a new something, very, sometimes it can be very small thing. That you dream about. Maybe if I get to jhana grow, maybe then I will get my jhanas. Yeah? Actually, it doesn't work like that. Yeah? It can be simple. We start off with really grandiose dreams when we are young. Yeah? Then we kind of scale down as we get older. We get a little bit more realistic. Yeah? Then we never get fully realistic. Yeah? There's still a residue of that dream left in us until we die, basically. Yeah? There's always something somewhere which seems brighter than it actually is. Yeah? And one of those uh, uh, beautiful little contemplations that Ajahn Brahm taught me very early on in my spiritual life, uh, was the contemplation of, and then what? And the, and then what contemplation? It takes away so much of that gloss of things. Yeah? It takes away the kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, shine of, of the sensual world. Uh, and uh, it is very useful, you know, when you, for example, you think about getting into a new relationship uh, and when you really fall in love with someone, you completely lose yourself. You have no idea what is really going on. The world is upside down compared to what it's supposed to be there. And so you have to ask yourself, and then what? Then? What happens afterwards? Okay, so you are with this person for a while, then what? Well, then you have to do the dishes. Uh, then you have to vacuum the floor. Uh, then you may probably have to have an argument. All relationships, ultimately, there's always going to be some arguments unless you are in an extraordinarily unusual deva-like relationship. I don't know if they really exist. There's some arguments going on. And one of the things that I always like to do when I kind of think that, yeah, maybe a relationship would be a nice idea, I always think, well, what, what are relationships really like? And I usually take my parents as an example. Would I want to have a relationship exactly like my parents' relationship? And it's not that my parents Parents had that relationship, they probably had a very good one, yeah, compared to the vast majority of the world. They were married for their whole life and, they, they, you know, they were happy together, basically. And still, when I looked at them, I wouldn't want to live like that. But would I be able to do anything better? Probably not. I have the same genetic material. I've been brought up by them, probably make exactly the same mistakes. And this is that dream of the future. And then it carries on. And even if you do have a a really nice relationship. Maybe, especially if you have a really nice relationship, there's always going to be a day when you're going to have to break up. There's always an end to the very best things in life. Death is always on the horizon. Doesn't leave in you is always a possibility. Yeah, these things are always there. And there's always that fear also that comes with the attachment of someone leaving. So you remind yourself of the reality of these things. And then the shine kind of gets taken off. You remember what is over the horizon there. You remember when you move into a new house, the dream house, yeah? The, and then you stay in that house for a while and then the neighbors turn out not to be as nice as you thought they might be. Yeah? The house, there are fittings and problems in the house that you I never had conceived would be problems. There are repair work to be done. Yeah? There's always endless problems around the corner there. Yeah? You get your dream car, someone drives into your dream car and crashes it, the brand new, I don't know what it is that you kind of car that you like to have. I remember when I was, uh, uh, when my brother got his first car, yeah, he was just turned 18 and my, uh, he got a car and, and then my father was going to take uh, his car for a drive just to test it out or whatever. And, uh, and then bang, he crashed my brother's car. <laughs> And my brother was really upset because of that. He was, oh no, my new car, I just got it. <laughs> and my father kind of 
brushed it was all, it was very interesting and this is the reality of things that things go wrong things are never really the way they seem to be yeah. Yeah, and I remember the way that Ajahn Brahm taught this and then what uh, idea he said well it's just like a, a movie yeah. yeah and at the end of the movie the cowboy kind of rides off into the sunset with the heroine going on the on the horse together yeah. and uh, it, then the movie stops yeah. and there is a reason why the movie stops there because that's where the fairy tale ends yeah. after that reality takes over yeah what happens when they ride off into the sunset? Well, they ride off and they have to do all the mundane things that everyone else has to do, yeah? And that life continues on its own. So uh, that, I think that is one of those uh, really clever little uh, ways of thinking about the future. And then what? Uh, and then what? Well, and then what ultimately? And then what? Death. Uh, you die and that's the end of it. Uh. So, um, I probably sound really negative and pessimistic kind of person, yeah, so I apologize for sounding so terrible, but um, this is what is in the suttas, I'm just saying what the Buddha said, I said that my job on this retreat was to present the Buddha, so that is what I'm doing, so uh, uh, it is worth listening though, because if the Buddha says it, well, uh, I think we can assume that there's something very profound and very truthful going on here. The next little simile is the simile of the uh, borrowed goods, and I talked about this already uh, uh, in quite a bit of detail before, so I'm not going to talk about it again. But uh, this simile just points to the fact that when we consider our life, we need to take the long term into account. Uh, this life is so short, uh, everything we have, we have in this life will pass so quickly. Uh, so if we invest, we want to invest beyond the horizon of this life. Uh, and this shows you why it matters so enormously to have an idea of rebirth in Buddhism. And even if you don't necessarily perhaps fully believe in it, you should still kind of consider that possibility because it opens up a horizon, a way of thinking about life, which is very different. Your investment strategy, your investment horizon, so to speak, changes dramatically as a consequence. Yeah, so uh, what does it mean that our investment strategy changes? And often it doesn't mean all that much. Yeah, it doesn't mean that you have to shave your hair and don the brown robes or yellow or ochre robes straight away. You don't have to kind of rush onto the next plane and try to get into Australia and put in the other monastery or rush off to an and say, please ordain me. You probably say it's not the right time yet. Wait till I have a monastery. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not really, that's not what it means. It can mean that for some people. Of course, there's nothing wrong with ordaining. In fact, I encourage it very much if that is what you are inclined towards because it is a very privileged lifestyle. Yeah, it is a lifestyle where ideally you get the probably the most ideal situation for practicing the Buddhist spiritual path. So it is actually great. I really, I cannot recommend this life more. more. Um, especially if you are in an established monastery like Bodhinyana, it's more difficult uh, in Venerable Chanda's situation, but hopefully she will also get things together eventually over in the UK. Uh, so uh, it, is a, it is a great thing, but what it means really to you know, change your investment horizon, it just means that your attitude to what you do is different. Uh, instead of focusing on results that belong to this life, uh, instead of focusing on results that have to do with career, have to do with material possessions, that even have to do with uh, uh, relationships, instead of focusing on those things and making those things the most important, what you make more important is how you do those things. Uh, what attitude, what motivation, what intentions you put into those, those things. Yeah? And it doesn't matter what kind of career you have. It doesn't really matter whether it goes well or not. You worry about the result. Uh, but what you do worry about is how you treat your co-workers, uh, how you treat your customers, uh, how you treat all the people in your life. Uh, that is what you worry about. Uh, and I like to say it is a change of thinking from changing from being result-oriented to being process-oriented. The Buddhist path is really all about process orientation, looking at the process, making the process important, because that is where you make the karma in the process. The result is actually quite irrelevant very often in the Buddhist point of view, especially the worldly results. They're not important. Sure, you can have good results, you can have bad ones, 
the plan is not what matters. So, and that is what uh, we would mean by uh, having a more long term outlook on how you think about life. So uh, it's fascinating, yeah, and you can see how that uh, danger of being trapped in one tiny slither of existence, this tiny little life that we have here, uh, and when we are trapped in that, we make lots of really bad decisions as a consequence, because we don't understand the larger picture. Uh, and that is why you need someone like the Buddha. Uh, you need the eye of the world, uh, the one who sees for us, uh, the one who is able to tell us that reality. Uh, then when you place faith and confidence in that word of the Buddha, it opens up your possibility for you to, to act on that reality. Yeah, we have to assume it is right, it was spoken by the Buddha. It gives us the opportunity to act on something that we cannot really know ourselves, but which, when we think about it, actually probably makes sense after all. So this is the importance of these things. And I think it's... We cannot really overestimate the importance of the idea of rebirth in Buddhism. This is only one such instance, but it is just so fundamental for the entire Buddhist outlook. Anyway, uh, let us go on to the uh, uh, last of the similes in this particular uh, sutta. And uh, this is the simile of the fruit. Uh, on a tree, uh, yeah, and uh, this is what the Buddha has to say. Suppose uh, there was a dark forest grove not far from a town or village, uh, and there was a tree laden with fruit, uh, yet none of the fruit had fallen to the ground. Uh, and along came a person in need of fruit, wandering in search of fruit, uh, having plunged deep into the forest grove. Uh, they'd see that tree laden with fruit, fruit, and they would think that tree is laden with fruit, yet none of the fruit has fallen to the ground, but I know how to climb a tree. Why don't I climb the tree, eat as much as I like, it, then fill my pouch? And that's what they would do. And along would came a second person in need of fruit, wandering in search of fruit, carrying a sharp axe. I mean, plunged deep into that forest grove and see that same tree laden with fruit. They would think that tree is laden with fruit, yet none of the fruit has fallen to the ground. But I don't know how to climb a tree. Why don't I chop this tree down at the root, eat as much fruit as I like it, then fill my pouch? And so they would do just that. What do you think, householder? If that first person who climbed the tree doesn't quickly come down when the tree fell, wouldn't they break their hand or arm or other limb, resulting in death or death-like suffering because of that? Yes, sir. In the same way, householder, a noble disciple reflects. With the simile of the fruit tree, the Buddha said that the sensory world gives little gratification and much suffering and distress, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Having truly seen this with right understanding, they reject the equanimity based on diversity and develop only the equanimity based on unity, where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights cease without anything left over. So, um, here we have this idea of a dark forest grove. Yeah, the, and this obviously is a simile for Sangsa, the dark forest where we are engulfed all day long by the five senses. Yeah, we cannot see very far because the five senses limit us. It limits the mind to what is immediately around us. So, so we are in a dark forest grove. You notice the word dark there. I, I wonder what the Pali is here. Uh, I'm not sure why he has chosen the word dark, but uh, that's what they tend to be, the forest grows anyway. Uh, and this is like our world. Our world is a little bit dark. Yeah, It's like we are enclosed by the five senses. Uh, we're not able to access those more beautiful and brighter states of mind where the world lights up and becomes far more delightful than it is with the five senses. So we're wandering around this confined space. Yeah, this 
uh, this um, world of the five senses wandering around this forest. Uh, and as we wander around this confined space of the world of the five senses, uh, we look around, look up the trees, looking for the delights of that world, looking for the fruits uh, of those trees. Uh, and occasionally we will come to a tree that has fruit, and some of those fruit will look really delicious and beautiful. Others will be more average, uh, and others will be really boring. Uh, and then when you come to some really delightful fruit, yeah, you are so happy. Yeah, a marvelous relationship, a beautiful a house or whatever it is that you, have in, you can have in your life. And you climb that tree and you get up there and you start eating that fruit, enjoying it. And as you are eating that fruit, you lose your sense of time and place. You have no idea what is going on. You get intoxicated by the beautiful taste of the mangoes, the sweet mangoes in that tree. And along comes another person uh, who also is interested in those same fruits, they have the same things. Uh, he comes along uh, and he decides to chop down, he or she decides to chop down this tree uh, because that's the only way they are able to get hold of those fruits. Uh, so he, here you can see the conflict between two people, yeah, and the conflict kind of uh, arising in this way. Uh, but uh, more importantly, I think the point of the simile is that. Uh, the first person is intoxicated. They don't know what is going on. They have stopped to look out for danger in this world. They have stopped to think about what is wrong, right and wrong. And because of that, they are in mortal danger. And before they know it, they might fall out of that tree and they might die, they might incur suffering because of that. And this is the reminder that the world of sensual pleasure is intoxicating. We cannot see clearly when we are intoxicated by the essential pleasures. Uh, we have vested interest. Uh, the things that we like, that we are attached to, we will guard them and we will fight for them uh, and we will do what is wrong to hold on to them. Why? Well, precisely because of the attachment. Uh, that is what it means to have a vested interest in things. Uh, so we will end up doing bad things as a consequence uh, of our desire for the sensory world. Uh, and when you think about it, this is so common in the world, yeah, that we do things that are wrong. First of all, to obtain what is great, people would do almost anything to obtain more money. They would cheat, they will do all kinds of dodgy things. Same thing with relationships, they will do all kinds of bad things. Yeah? Why? Precisely because they are intoxicated. And when you are intoxicated, you forget what is right and wrong. All you can see is the thing in front of you. If what really is important in your life are the sensory objects of the world, and if you have no conception of a future life, if you have no conception of what it does to your mind to live in a bad way, to be angry, to be cruel, to be harsh towards other living beings, if you have no conception of that, and all that matters to you is the sensual objects of the world, of course, you're going to pursue those sensual objects. Why? Well, because that's what life is about. That is what is interesting. That is what gives you happiness. Yeah. And you don't really understand the broader picture at all. And this is the problem. Yeah. And this is why pursuing these short term things causes so much problems, unless you have a more spiritual outlook, you have a larger idea of what life is all about. And uh, so uh, watch out for that intoxication with essential pleasures. Uh, watch out for those attachments that make us biased in a certain way, uh, because they really lead to so much suffering and so many problems down the road. Uh. And uh, of course, you will know what the alternative to this is, uh, because the alternative to this is also expressed in the sutras very beautifully. Uh. That alternative is the a simile of the mountain, which is found in Majjhimanikaya 125, the Danta Bhumi Sutta, the level of the tamed. And it is a long simile about the taming of elephants. And, but this particular simile is a simile of a, a, a novice monk called Agivesana, I think, I, seem to, I believe. And this novice monk, he is um, uh, visited by a prince called Jayasena. And this prince, Jayasena, he says to this novice monk that I have heard that, uh, uh, you know, about one-pointedness of mind, yeah, about samadhi. Yeah. Is it true that there is such a thing as one-pointedness of mind and samadhi? Yeah. And then this novice monk, Agivesana, he says to the prince that, yes, there is such a thing, yeah. And then he tries to explain to him uh, how this works out, what it actually means, the idea of one-pointedness of mind and samadhi. 
And then the prince kind of scoffs at it. There's no way the researcher thinks as a I don't believe a word in what you're saying. And he walks off in a huff, yeah, upset with his novice monk. Yeah, you're just a young monk, you haven't got a clue. Yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> And so this novice monk is a bit upset. Yeah, he has kind of failed to present the Dhamma in a way that is it's terrible. I, I know that in myself, in my own situation, we get a question by somebody and you feel that you answer the question really poorly. You feel you haven't really been able to explain yourself properly. It's as if you have uh, short change the Buddha. Yeah, you're supposed to be the Buddha's representative for goodness sake. You can't even explain the teachings properly. What kind of monk is that? And you feel really bad about yourself. You have wasted an opportunity to actually explain something very important. And no doubt, during this retreat, that will happen many times. And it's poorly. And then I will afterwards will think, cheapest, why did I explain in that way when I could have said things in a better way? Or I listen to what I say afterwards. I think, cheapest, did I really say that? What a terrible I probably won't listen to what I say afterwards because it's just a downer when you do do that very often. Eh? But hopefully you will get a lot out of it anyway. I have no doubt that you will, because the word of the Buddha is just often so nice. Eh? So anyway, so this uh, prince, Agilesana, he goes to the Buddha and he tells the Buddha what happened. Eh? And then the Buddha tells him, well, if you had remembered these two similes, eh, you would have been able to convince Prince Dayasena. And one of those similes is the simile of the mountain. Eh? If you want to look it up, Majjhima Nikaya 125. Eh? And the simile of the mountain, many of you will have heard it before because it is a, a, a simile that I talk about quite regularly in these talks. And the simile of the mountain is two friends walking up to the foot of the mountain. And then one friend says to the other, let's go to the top. Yeah, let's just check out the top of this mountain. And the other friend says, nah, I couldn't be bothered. Yeah, it's too hard work to walk up the top of the mountain. You go up, I will wait at the bottom. So the one friend, he climbs up to the top of the mountain, probably more like a hill. Yeah? The words here are, I think sometimes it's not quite accurate. I think hill would be a much better word. Goes up to the top of the hill, yeah, and he goes up, and when he gets to the top, he looks out, and he says, wow, he shouts down to his friend, wow, you wouldn't believe what I see from the top of the hill. I see roads, I see lakes, I see landscapes, and I see all kinds of things. I see roads, I see fields and everything around me. And uh, uh, it is just so magnificent, the view from the top of this mountain. And the friend at the bottom keeps on scoffing and saying, no, nah, I don't believe anything of that. What, what you're saying, I don't see any roads from down here. So what you're saying cannot possibly be true. And at this point, the friend on the top of the mountain, is like the Buddha on the top of the mountain, yeah? He has seen, he has looked out, seen the broader range of things. So he goes down to the bottom, grabs this fellow by the arm, and pulls him up, drags him up to the top of the mountain, and says, look, what do you see? Oh, he says, a bit interesting now. Oh, yeah, you're, yeah. <laughs> I see fields and roads and villages. Yeah, you're, you're right. You know, you're, it's all there. So why? How come just a few minutes ago when you were at the bottom of the mountain, how come you said they didn't exist? And then this friend expl explains, well, when I was at the foot of the mountain, this whole mountain, this whole hill was in the way. And that is why I couldn't see what was on the other side. And the point here is that the hill symbolizes the five hindrances. One of the main aspects of the five hindrances is, of course, the first one. It is sensual attachment. It is precisely the sensory world. The sensory world was in the way. I couldn't see what was actually there. But when you rise above the sensory world, above the mountain, above the jungle around, around you, you get away from that. That is when you get the bird's eye view. That's when you can see out. That's when you can understand what the landscape below actually is all about. You can understand its details. You can understand the nature of the sensory world. And this is what we try to do in meditation. We try to lift ourselves by elevating our mind, by inflating our mind with helium. Yeah, don't use hydrogen because hydrogen is explosive. Use helium. Inflate your mind with helium. What is that helium? It's a joy. It's the happiness of meditation. It's the peace and tranquility that we get. That is the helium of the mind. You inflate the mind so we soar up. And as you soar up, you start to shed the lower things in the world, the sensual objects of the world, 
all the desires, the attachments that belong to that world, it gradually sends and you soar and soar and soar. You cut off the sandbags that are holding you down. This is the attachment to the sensory world. And you get the bird's eye view and you start to understand the nature of the sensory world. And what you see is that it is deeply problematic. You see that it is a as craving connected with it everywhere and that craving is just troublesome it is agitating it is restless it is actually a pain and you start to understand that even if there wasn't any craving the satisfaction you get from the sensory world is so shallow there's no real satisfaction there there's a kind of gross kind of happiness but it's nothing but the kind of happiness that you can get in meditation practice so this is what we're trying to do in our meditation. We're trying to make ourselves lighter human beings with brighter minds, with more uh, beautiful outlook on the world. This is what this is about, soaring up above the jungle of humanity, the jungle of the sensory world, understanding what life really is about. And in uh, that context, find the very meaning of life itself. It's a beautiful simile. I love the similes of the mountains in the suttas. They're really nice. And of course, what is interesting, Ajahn Brahm also has almost exactly the same simile that he uses to explain his own understanding of the spiritual path. When he also traveled to Guatemala, he saw the ancient Mayan pyramids in the Yucatan Peninsula in Guatemala or Mexico or wherever. And uh, had a similar kind of spiritual experience uh, by climbing those pyramids, uh, getting above the jungle, understanding the nature of the sensory world in an entirely new way. So this is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to achieve on this path, uh, removing ourselves from, uh, lightening ourselves so we can uh, get a broader bird's eye view of reality. So there you are. That is uh, uh, this uh, marvelous sutta on uh, Portalia, on the sensory world. And please uh, check it out yourself, uh, read the suttas yourself and see what it does to you uh, and see if you can find new ways of interpreting this because these things, these are just my interpretations. Yeah? This is the way I read these things. Uh, but there, is, there are more ways of understanding these things. These similes are very rich in content. Uh, and sometimes if you reflect on them in a wise way, you can draw out some of the beautiful things of the similes. So make them come alive, make them meaningful to you. Yeah? They become like a force in your practice, something that propels you along the Buddhist path. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so uh, there you are. So now let us move on a little bit. We're going to move on to the next little sutta. So I can't remember now exactly what's coming, really, because I have kind of, uh, oh, yeah, that's what's, what's coming. Okay, this is really cool stuff. So we're, this is, uh, yeah. So uh, the next sutta, I have included a few suttas with uh, verse this time. Usually I don't usually do much verse, but uh, I've realized recently that some of the suttas as with the verse are actually very beautiful and inspiring. There's something about verse which has a, it doesn't have the same accuracy perhaps as the prose. It doesn't give you the same information perhaps, but it's inspiring in a deeper way. It kind of nourishes the emotions and the heart in a different way. And for that reason, it's actually, I think, quite uh, useful and quite uh, appropriate to look at the verses as well. Huh? So the next sutta here is. Um, from the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, SN14. Uh, this is the first one, the first chapter in this particular book. And this is the Buddha conversing with the devas, yeah, with the gods. And uh, it's kind of nice, yeah, the Buddha talking to the gods and see what they have to kind of talk about, uh, how they deal with these things. And of course, the reality is that gods and buddhism they're just really glorified human beings they're just pretty much like us so the kind of things that they talk about are basically what we talk about the problems they have the same problems we have and so it is just a more uh, kind of elevated conversation but basically about the same thing so so this is the fourth sutta in the devata sangyuta and it is titled time flies by and uh, this is uh, 
Well, it says that. At Savati, standing to one side, the Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Buddha. Time flies by, the nights swiftly pass, the stages of life successively desert us. Seeing clearly this danger in death, one should do deeds of merit that bring happiness. So that is the Devata, yeah, and you will recognize a lot of this is very Buddhist. Yeah? In fact, you can argue all of this is really Buddhist in a certain way. Yeah, time flies by, the nights swiftly pass. Uh, life is so short, yeah, the stages of life successively desert us. Uh, it's kind of this uh, idea of swiftly passing. Uh, there is a beautiful simile in one of the suttas in the Gutra Nikai 7, the Araka Sutta, I think uh, 771, uh, it was around 70 somewhere. And there is this fellow called Araka, and he has all these similes for how for life and how quickly life goes. Yeah, and it's really amazing similes. And one of the similes is like life is like the dew on a blade of grass. Us. When the sun comes out in the morning, the dew evaporates just like that. In the same way, life is short, just like the dew on the blade of grass. <laughs> now, the beautiful simile there is precisely the simile of the mountain stream. Yeah, just like a mountain stream uh, is very fast and very swift because it comes down the steep hills of the mountain, uh, carrying a lot of flotsam with it as it goes down swiftly, swiftly. Uh, in the same way, human life is like a mountain stream, swiftly moving on, yeah? Always running around, moving from one thing to another one. And it's kind of fascinating. This is what it was said at the time of the Buddha. And you would have thought that the taste of life at the time of the Buddha was pretty not so bad, yeah? At the time of the Buddha, surely they're using, you know, horses and carriages and ox carts. I mean, surely the taste could be that great. But, uh, you know, even they thought the pace of life was too fast, let alone now, where people are kind of going completely nuts with uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so life is so quick, and the more stuff we do, the more we pack into it, the more fast it goes, and the less time we have for reflection and understanding what is going on. We are like a mountain stream moving on, run by craving, restlessly moving along, and all the flotsam that we carry with us is almost like all the the debris in the uh, in the um, mountain stream is like the collateral damage in our lives uh, you know like the collateral damage in the war is like the collateral damage all the things that we do and how we affect people around us uh, often there is a lot of negative effect with how we live our life when we are run by craving because craving makes us do all the bad things uh, and there's another simile in that Arika Sutta. I should have brought this Sutta out, uh, which is really nice. And it's a simile of the cow being led to slaughter. Yeah. And the Buddha says, with, not the Buddha, Arika says that with every step that cow takes, uh, it is one step closer to slaughter. In the same way with human life, with every step we take, uh, we are one step closer to death. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, whoa, <laughs> one step closer to death. Yeah, it's kind of a nice way of reminding you. Yeah, it's a nice way of keeping that memory. Yeah? Every time you do something, every time you breathe, you're one breath closer to death. Yeah, it is always there, always a potential, not possibly not very far away. Yeah? So those are some of the, um, uh, the similes you find there. Yeah? The idea that life can be so short, so you see this danger in death. Danger is, death is always around the corner because of that. You cannot wait with making merit. Now is the time to make merit. Now is the time to build up that happiness inside. If you don't do it now, then who knows if it's going to happen. Every opportunity counts, yeah? I, um, you know, uh, so I, even now when you're listening, are you listening with the right kind of attitude? Are you listening with a way whereby you are building up something positive, yeah? Even if uh, you don't like maybe every sutta, at least you're trying to kind of uh, take something positive away from it. When I speak, am I speaking with the right attitude? Am I thinking about the 
benefit, hopefully, that my audience will gain from this? And this is the question I should ask myself as I'm talking all the time. Am I doing this in the right way? And then we are on the right track. Everything we do is a potential for doing something good, for making merit. Listening, talking, whatever it is that we do is always there if we have the right attitude. So making merit, yeah, but of course the Buddha is not really satisfied with making merit. There's nothing wrong with that. It is true, the Buddha says elsewhere, that merit is just another term for happiness. And he says that even monastics should make merit because it builds up those qualities that enable meditation later on. But we want to go beyond that. So the Buddha will always give you an alternative way of looking at this. So this is what the Buddha responds to this devata. He says, time flies by, the nights swiftly pass, the stages of life successively desert us, See clearly this danger in death, the seeker of peace should drop the world's fate. So uh, uh, this is a bit different, yeah? This is understanding that we need to go beyond the idea of making merit. Yes, we need to make merit, but we should do more than that. We should drop the world's bait. What is the world's bait? And the main thing that is the world's bait is precisely the world of the five senses. Yeah, the attraction in that world where we're always holding on. Every time you attach to that, it's like the bait. You get hooked. Yeah, you, you literally get hooked into those things. Yeah attachment of the hook yeah and then suffering arises as a consequence it's almost like you're a fish eating into that bait and of course as a consequence you swallow the hook at the same time and then you are uh, subject to mara's uh, work and mara can do with you as he likes as it says in the suttas because you are swallowed hook line and sinker the whole thing and now you have a problem as a consequence so the world's bait is largely the sensory world around us. But there's another bait, yeah, which is even more profound. And that is the bait of the sense of I, how we hold on to this identity, how we hold on to the who we think we are, our sense of being, our sense of existence. I want to carry on. I want to live. I want to make a difference. I am important. I matter in this world. That is a deeper bait that we also have to let go ultimately. But uh, for now, let's stick to the bait that is the five sense world, because that is a, sort of the theme of what we're looking at now. Anyway, time flies by. Next sutta, reaching. This is the same Devata Sangyuta, Sangyuta Nikaya 1-3. Uh, it's called, this sutta is called reaching. And uh, similar kind of, uh, similar, very similar to the previous one. Uh, So uh, here the Buddha, uh, the Devata says again, it's at Savati, standing to one side. The Devata recited this verse in the presence of the Blessed One. Life is swept along, short is the lifespan. No shelter exists for one who has reached old age. Seeing clearly this danger in death, one should do deeds of merit that bring happiness. So very, very similar to the previous one, but here we have the idea that no shelter exists for one who has reached old age. Yeah, if you come to old age, but you haven't lived in the right way, it is too late very often. Yeah, now is the opportunity. Take it now. If you wait till you are on your deathbed, there's nothing much more you can do. You really had it and you're finished. Now you have to reap the consequences of your action the shelter is what you built up in this life. So make sure you build that shelter uh, which enables you to enjoy whatever future you can have. Uh. Again, the Buddha agrees with this verse, uh, but again, he changes the last line. Uh. Life is swept along, uh, short is the lifespan. Uh. No shelter exists for one who has reached all that. Clearly, this danger in death, uh, the secret peace uh, should drop the world's fate. Uh. So uh, I don't know what you think, whether you like this. I find it quite uh, inspiring, actually. It's a poetic way of saying the same things that we have been talking about all the way through, really, about the problems of sensual pleasures and all of that. Uh, 
but it's a more poetic expression of the same thing. Yeah. Now I want to talk in the last sutta, which is going to be about after, uh, suffering and about the uh, sensual world uh, uh, specifically. And then tomorrow we can start working on the causes of uh, uh, suffering. Uh, and this is the Samidhi Sutta, one of my favorite little suttas. Uh, and this is what you might call a Theravada Cohen Sutta because it has a little paradox at its heart. And of course, Cohen's are often are paradoxes, but uh, I think that some of the earliest paradoxes are actually found in the early Buddhism. And that maybe the idea of Cohen's, maybe the Buddha actually started this idea in a certain way. Yeah, maybe not quite as extreme as the Cohen's we got later the similar kind of ideas that you find in the suttas. So this is a little paradox sutta. And uh, as often is the case with paradoxes, uh, that idea is that there's only a paradox on the surface, uh, but underlying the paradox, there is a deeper truth. Uh, so if we can kind of think about the paradox in the right way, we can understand something more profound about the Dhamma. And that is kind of the point about this. Uh, so this is the Samidhi Sutta, yeah? And it's a kind of an interesting setting, this whole Sutta. There's a kind of tension here, which is uh, fascinating. Yeah? So this is how this goes. Yeah, I will, I will read it out for you, and then you can see what you think about this. Uh, uh, thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Buddha was dwelling at Rajagaha in the Hot Springs Park. Then the Venerable Samidhi, having risen at the first flush of dawn, went to the hot springs to bathe. Having bathed in the hot springs and come back out, he stood in one robe drying his limbs. Then, when the night had advanced, a certain devata of stunning beauty, illuminating the entire hot springs, approached the Venerable Samidhi. Having approached, he stood in the air, and address the Venerable Samiti in verse. Yeah, so this is a kind of a, a, a really powerful setting. Yeah, there's this monk there. Uh, he is at the hot springs in the park in Rajagaha. And by the way, those hot springs still in the present day. You can find them and the, the local Indian population still bathing in those hot springs two and a half thousand years later. It's kind of really cool traveling to India and seeing these things. It makes the suttas come alive in a very interesting way. Anyway, I'm not going to go too much into that because as always, time is uh, at the premium. So, um, and then we have this monk, yeah? And this is a kind of classic situation. You can see there is this uh, tempting situation. Yeah? There is a beautiful devata coming and uh, it is said to be a she here. It is not expressively expressly said in the sutta that it is a she, but uh, it kind of makes the whole situation more interesting, yeah, more tense almost, if it is like a ma one male and one female coming together in this way. Yeah. So this makes it very fascinating, and especially when you know what she is going to say, it makes it even more interesting yeah, what is happening in this sutta. So she approaches him, yeah, stunning beauty and all of these things, uh, and uh, he is kind of standing there in one row, but the whole thing is kind of interesting. Yeah? And this is what she says. Uh, she says to Venerable uh, Samidhi, without having enjoyed it, you seek arms, Bhikkhu. You don't seek arms after you have enjoyed it. First enjoy Bhikkhu, then seek arms. Don't let the time pass you by. Yeah, so the, this is, uh, uh, this, we will see this in a second, what this means, but already you kind of get the feeling, yeah, what this means, of course, uh, that here you are, you are, you know, enjoying, you are kind of seeking arms, uh, but you haven't really enjoyed life yet, uh, yeah, shouldn't you come out in life and enjoy all the sensual pleasures of the world. You are young. You can have a beautiful wife and you can kind of, you know, mess around and enjoy yourself and entertainment and have nice food and whatever. What are you messing around with arms ball for and living in a celibate way in this way? You're wasting an opportunity. Yeah. Enjoy first. When you get old, then you can go forward. Yeah. Because when you get old, it's much more difficult to enjoy the sensual pleasures. Enjoy the right thing at the right time. Yeah. Don't let the time pass you by. Now is the opportunity. 
So what does he say? And this is what he says. I do not know what the time might be. The time is hidden and cannot be seen. Hence, without enjoying, I seek arms. Don't let the time pass me by. And what is this time business anyway? Do we really know what is, uh, uh, what is the right time for doing what? Uh, what exactly is going on? He's kind of saying here that he is a little bit blind. He cannot really understand what this time is, what is the right time for doing what? Uh, and so he is worried that he might actually miss out on the holy life instead. Uh, and that's why he's practicing this. And that is what he says is not to let the time, uh, don't let the time pass me by. He's actually practicing the holy life, not enjoying sexual pleasures. Sir. So they have the opposite views of things, yeah? And then the sutta goes on. Then that devata alighted on the earth and said it to the venerable Samidhi, you have gone forth while young Bhikkhu, a lad with black hair, endowed with the blessing of youth in the prime of life, without having dallied with sensual pleasures, without having enjoyed sensual pleasures. Enjoy human sensual pleasures, Bhikkhu. Do not abandon what is directly visible in order to pursue what takes time. And he replies, I have not abandoned what is directly visible, friend, in order to pursue what takes time. I have abandoned what takes time in order to pursue what is directly visible. For the Buddha friend has stated that sensual pleasures are time consuming, full of suffering, full of despair, and the danger in them is still greater. While this Dhamma is directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable to be personally experienced by the wise. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting one. It, it uh, starts you to, to help you to think about the Dhamma in the right way when you consider what is going on here. Because at first, when you first read this, it seems as if the Devata is truly right. He had the sensual pleasures of the world, they are immediately available, yeah. And when as this meditation business, you sit down, close your eyes, you you know, you start snoring, you nod off, and you are restless, and maybe sometimes you're just thinking about things and think, wonder where is this heading? Am I really achieving anything? Am I going anywhere? Sometimes people have this experience in their in their life. And they wonder, is it really working? Is anything happening in this? Whereas the world is just there. The world is my oyster. Is there for the taking to be enjoyed straight away? And uh, I know that people sometimes think the Devata is surely right in this particular case. But of course, we also know that the Devata is not right because there's something wrong with that way of thinking. And of course, what, we, what is wrong with that way of thinking? Later on, uh, they go to the Buddha and ask him to solve this. And I'm going to paraphrase what the Buddha said or give my own uh, slant on this. So because uh, the problem with the sensory world it is that it is not really there for the taking. Uh, the sensory world is always about the future. Uh, it is always about craving. Uh, it is always about moving on uh, to something else. Uh, yeah, you get one thing, it doesn't really satisfy you deeply, as I mentioned before, because it is an external thing, trying to satisfy an inner psychological problem. And because it doesn't satisfy you, craving just goes on, and it goes on, and it's always about the future, always moving on to something, never achieving a goal, never achieving a true purpose. And this is a problem with that sensory world. So actually, it is the sensory world which is time consuming. Not just time consuming, yet it can never actually achieve what it promises. But the Dhamma, if you think about it in the right way, if you have success in meditation, if you are able to let go one day, if you're able to do a pure selfless act, if you're able to give an act of dana to somebody or an act of generosity, if you are kind, even just thinking the right thing at the right time, and you feel a sense of satisfaction with that. And with that satisfaction comes a contentment that is immediately felt right here and right now. This is the difference with the Dhamma happiness. The Dhamma happiness has nothing to do with craving. It is not about the future. It is an immediately experienced happiness that we have now. And that is the power of the Dhamma. It's just about turning your mind in the right direction. Yeah, Turning your mind to that act of generosity. 
thinking about it in the right way, then expressing it through uh, whatever way you want to express it, and then you feel the happiness of the Dhamma. So this is a, then a much more real happiness, yeah? that happiness that doesn't really uh, involve the future in the same way. Yeah? And this is the promise that the Buddha gives us with the way that he uh, teaches uh, the Dhamma, in a sense. So uh, it's a beautiful little um, paradox uh, because it uh, kind of uh, points to something which I think is always a problem with the Dhamma. Yeah, the idea that we are sometimes concerned that we are not making progress, uh, concerned that our meditation is not going anywhere. Uh, but the answer to that is not to give up. Uh, the answer to that is always to ask yourself why. Uh, yeah, because there is a reason if you are not progressing, uh, there is a reason for that. Uh, it is not that uh, the Dhamma doesn't work. Uh, you know the Dhamma works because when you get it right, you can feel the results straight away. Uh, yeah. When you really are kind, you really do feel joyful and happy about it. So you need to ask yourself, why doesn't it work? Have I not put into place the foundational things that need to be put into place? Do I need to purify myself more? Remember the profundity of sila, or morality, on the Buddhist path. Yeah? It's about avoiding the bad, but also about doing good. It's about... Uh, not just about how we act in the world, but how we think privately to ourselves. Uh, how do you think about yourself? How do you think about life? How do you think about other people? What is your inner world like? That inner world needs to be purified. Uh, that, is the, that is the point. And all of the things that we have been looking at so far, the learning how to think about the sensory world, that is part of that purification. Yeah. Why? Because as you see the limits of that world, you are reducing your desires, reducing your cravings for that world, you start to turn inwards, and as, the, as you let go of the external world, and you turn inwards, and you build up the qualities within, it's like there is an a inverse, one side goes down while the other side goes, goes up. Yeah? The sensual world kind of disappears, fades away, and the spiritual world instead uh, 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 kind of emerges as a consequence of that. The two are almost like inversely, inversely proportional to each other. Uh, yeah? So you purify yourself in this way. Uh, but more importantly, you also I'll talk more about this later on. Uh, also, you purify. Uh, other defilements, defilements such as ill will, yeah? and you learn the techniques that the Buddha taught uh, to purify your mind from these things. And you have, sometimes you have to be brutally honest with yourself. Uh, you really have to look at yourself very clearly. What is my problem? Uh, why isn't progress happening? Yeah? Can I make progress go even faster? Even if you are making progress, you should ask yourself, well, can I do more? Yeah? If I carry on in this way, sometimes people do well for a while, then they plateau, they come to a stop. How can I get out of this plateau? How can I keep on moving forward in the good way? Yeah? And um, I have been a Buddhist monk now for... 25 years plus, yeah, living in monasteries for almost 30 years. And uh, this is one of the things that has been kind of critical, I found, in my monastic life. Always asking myself, where am I stuck? What am I getting wrong? Yeah. And as I have uncovered these things, and sometimes it's painful. Yeah? You have to see that there are aspects of your habits, of your personality, that are perhaps not as marvelous as you thought they were. <laughs> That can be painful to uncover that because you realize that maybe I've been fooling myself about myself, deluding myself into thinking that I was doing something right, which maybe wasn't quite right. I need to change my attitude, the way I speak in this particular instance or whatever it is. But as you uncover these things, and these are called treasures by the Buddha, yeah, they're treasures because as you uncover them, that is what allows you to move forward. And then you let go of those defilements and you move forward. And I have found in my own spiritual life. It has been has it made massive change over time. Yeah? The person I am now compared to the person when I started out this monastic life is just very different. Of course, there's a lot of similarity as well, but in many ways it is very different. Uh, that is this whole process of purification, uh, building up, allowing these things to come through, uh, and then you start to understand what it means that the Dhamma is immediate. Uh, it is immediate because the results are here and now. They have nothing to do with craving and desire. 
now you're experiencing uh, what uh, this part of Dharma is all about. Anyway, I shall stop there because this is a great place to stop. And uh, we can do some questions. Uh, have we got some questions, Madam Rohan? We've got a lot of questions, Ajahn, so I'm not okay. sure we can try to get through them, but um, I guess maybe fairly brief answers might be good sure. so that we, yeah. can, we can cover something significant. Okay, so the first question is, uh, I tend to suffer with the suffering of other people, namely the suffering of wars, lack of food, violence, and nowadays a lot of suffering nearby because of the things around COVID. I also feel I should do something to help and sometimes I get involved um, and that brings more confusion. How to relate to this according to the first noble truth? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a marvelous question. I think it's a really good question and I think it's a, an important one. And there is a couple of ways of relating to that. But the, the first one is to remember that so much of the suffering that we see in the world is often like of a temporary kind yeah it is like people dying and people crying and people grieving and, and of course it is all it is all terrible what we do not really understand is the qualities of those people who die yeah and many of those people who die would have been very good people then so they die and then they may very, probably get reborn in a good place as a consequence so very often the victims in a situation like war are often not the people we should grieve the most for because they might die, they will suffer somewhat, but then they might get reborn in a good place afterwards. So, but the perpetrators, yeah, it is far worse for the perpetrators because the perpetrators, well, they actually have a very bad outlook for the future. Yeah. So sometimes we should maybe grieve more for the perpetrators than for the victims somehow. Yeah. Uh, the same is true for the people who are left behind. Yeah, they, it is true there's a lot of grief, a lot of problem when family members or whatever, you know, get killed and maimed in war. And that grief also is uh, temporary, is a kind of grief that we all have to go through in life and we lose loved ones. So it is no different from the grief that you and I and everyone else has to go through. It's just that it comes more abruptly and it comes in a way that is more violent. But the basic thing is the same. Yeah. So it is just ordinary life having a slightly different shape. And again, it is the heart of that person that really matters. If they have a good heart, if they are a good person, and in the long run, they will overcome that grief. Yeah? It will last for a few months, sometime a few weeks, maybe a few months for a few people, a few years, but eventually they will come out of that. And when they come out of that, they will still have those good qualities with them, which they will be able to live on. They will have something found their life on, which will make it less difficult for them. And then when they die, eventually they will carry on into the future. So look more deeply than the superficial suffering. Yeah, yeah it is the underlying qualities are far more important in people. Yeah? And uh, that often we cannot see. So things are not as bleak as they may seem sometimes. There's something more uh, underlying this. So, um, then there is uh, also the fact that uh, one of the things that you also often find is that at times of difficulties, uh, often the very best qualities in people come out. Yeah, You see, there are some people who are magnificent at times of difficulties. They kind of, they become so self-sacrificing, yeah, but not in a bad way, self-sacrificing in a positive way in which they too um, feel joy and happiness in what they are doing. You see that in the concentration camps in Germany during the Second World War. You see that in all wars around us. You see that during the COVID, uh, time people sacrifice themselves and support yeah other people because they understand these are difficult times uh. so sometimes the best qualities in people come out during difficult times uh. so look for that see the goodness that comes out in people yeah and um, it is fascinating i often talked about a book that i read uh, this was actually an ex an ex-girlfriend this is a long time ago now and we're 30 I don't know, over 30 years ago. And uh, she gave me a book, yeah, and she's told me, okay, read this, okay, so I, you know, had a look at it, I read, it, read the book because, uh, because she gave it to me, I suppose, and this was about human beings and happiness, and 
it had this strange um, observation that this man made. It was written soon after the Second World War. A strange observation that he made that people were often more happy during the Second World War than they were before the Second World War. Yeah, and he thought that the reason was because, well, when there is war around you and everything is kind of crashing down, well, people kind of get together. Yeah, and they work together, they cooperate in a new way, they are more supportive of each other, they think about life in a different way, they become more compassionate and more caring in a strange way. So sometimes the most difficult times actually turn out to be spiritual highlights. And if you look at it from a Buddhist point of view, you can see that when the external world no longer gives any satisfaction, when the external world do in the Second World War, it was very hard to get food, yeah, people had to eat very basic food, everything was rationed during the war, hard to get proper clothes, yeah, you had again, it was rationed out to people, uh, relatives would die, there were people were sent off to concentration camps in Germany and all of these kind of things, it was a very difficult time, even though in Norway, Norway was very, it was, the Second World War was very limited in Norway compared to most of Europe, um, but uh, still, it was a very hard time, and yet the happiness was great. So when you see that the five sense world is no longer can no longer give you any satisfaction, it's staring you in the face. Yeah, the problem for us is not really staring us in the face. We have to reflect about this five sense world being problematic. But during war, it is so obvious. There's only one place to turn to spiritual politics. Yeah, they, may, they didn't know that they were turning to spiritual qualities. That's what they were doing. They were turning to compassion, to supporting each other, for caring for each other, working together in harmony. These are all spiritual qualities. It just happens naturally because there's nowhere else to turn. So uh, and this is um, one of those fascinating things about life, yeah? how this often happens. Uh, the best can sometimes come out of people. So when you see those pictures on TV of war or you hear about the problems, in Myanmar or you see what's happening around the world remember there's much more going on there that you cannot see yeah there's things going on behind the surface that are much more optimistic life is not often not what it seems and that is uh, I think one of the dangers of watching too much news on tv you just get the very one-sided view of the world it's not realistic at all about what actually is happening here. so that is one side of the story but the other side of the story is that you are right there still is a lot of suffering and war causes enormous amounts of suffering of course it does it may be temporary some people might be able to deal with it it might bring out good qualities in many people still there is also a lot of suffering here so the second way of thinking about this is to remember that this is the nature of the world yeah the world is unreliable we, most of us probably, I don't know if any of you have ever lived in the war zone. I have never lived in the war zone. I have no idea what it is like. But um, I, I, I don't particularly want to, to live in the war zone. I probably nobody would want to do that. Yeah, But that is always possible. Yeah, It is not as if we have entered a new kind of uh, age where war has become impossible. Of course not. This is just a delusion again. So when you see those things on TV, remember this is actually the nature of the world. This is what it's like. This is part and parcel why it is so unsatisfactory in the long run. Wars, famines, climate change, COVID, yeah? And then one COVID is gone, another COVID is staring you in the face around the corner. COVID is here a metaphor for all the things that go wrong in the world. Yeah, this is the nature of the world. And this is what we have to take in. And I know it is hard. And this is why we have to sort of, you know, gradually, gradually allow this truth to sort of become more clear because then the world is less interesting then we turn to spiritual qualities our values are changed as a consequence when we understand the nature of the five sense realm as i said before five senses implies ill will it implies conflict it implies wars why because the five senses are always the object of the five senses are always fought over they are uh, we are competing over these things and for that reason, there's always going to be conflict in that area. So those are the two things I would recommend you to do. See, look beyond the surface, and you will see many things there that actually are quite positive. 
uh, but also remembering that this is the nature of the world uh, and use that as a deeper contemplation of the path of Dhamma. Okay. Great. Um, so there are two questions about um, the equanimity based on diversity and the equanimity based on unity and whether this means we should abandon all um, sense pleasures. Um, <laughs> I, th I think the, the idea here is that you want to uh, discover something deeper, yeah, if you know the unsatisfactoriness of the sensual world, and then you don't want to rely on that sensory world for your happiness, and if you rely on a world that is inherently out of control, inherently problematic for your happiness, well, then your happiness is going to be very dodgy, it's going to be very out of control as well, and yeah, and it's going to turn into suffering before you know it. So it is not, it doesn't mean that we should Give up all enjoyment of the senses. Do enjoy the senses, but don't attach too much to that world. Yeah, like I mentioned yesterday, for example, uh, like with food, for example. Yeah, uh, be more concerned about what you think about when you are not eating. Enjoy your food. I enjoy my food. Ajahn Brahm enjoys his food. The Buddha enjoyed his food. It seems. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the food, but have the right attitude towards it. Once you've finished eating, let it go, be finished with it, and then carry on. Um, with the world around us, it's more difficult, yeah, I, because um, I don't know about you, but I'm sort of a little bit attached to the world around me. When I look at the Buddhist monastery here, and I see the forest, and I see the little kutis, and I see this little studio in here, and I think about it's all going to be demolished eventually down the track. It, it is not a very pleasant thought, yeah, but it is a kind of reality. And that is where you can see your attachments to the world. Yeah, and like the question before about war, you see the war happening around the world and you feel a sense of despair or sadness about that. Well, then you have an attachment to the world at large. You don't want to see war. That is where your attachment is. And that is where the problem arises. And that's where you need to do something. So you remind yourself that that world is out of control. <clears throat> Don't allow me <coughs> to attach too much to all of that realm. Yeah? To, I mean, sometimes we are attached to things things like democracy, yeah, we think, well, oh, democratic institutions are great. And then we see all these autocrats around the world, they're taking over, they go, oh, no, no, the democratic institutions are kind of falling by the way. So that's another attachment to the world, yeah? There's no law of nature that says that things have to be democratic. Yeah? They will come, dem democracies will come and go, just like autocracies come and go. This is just uh, politics coming back and forth, but, yeah? Anyway, that's how it seems to me. Yeah? So wherever you look at the world, whenever you look at TV and you think, oh no, yeah, what, what is happening here? At that moment, you know you have an attachment to the five sense world. Take the very broad outlook on this world, yeah? Um, of, of course, a very big one is our relationships with the people who are close to us, our partner in life. That is a very, very big one. And they all it's very useful to be aware that on the track that is going to be a big problem for us, yeah, especially if we are very attached to our partner. So what is the best way to deal with that? Well, the best way to deal with that is to make even our family life or monastic life, if you're a monastic or whatever it is, make all of that into a spiritual path. Build up, yeah, the more you can build up good qualities inside of you, the more you will be the more insulation you will have against the shocks of life when people die and when your family members get sick or whatever, because you will have an independent kind of happiness within you that you will be able to rely on in that context. So it doesn't mean that we should reject our families. Far from it. It means the exact opposite. It means that we should be even more kind to our families. We should be even more careful with how we treat them, yeah? because we want to build up that kindness. And that kindness will eventually turn into more independence from that world. Then we are giving up the sensual world in the right way. That is how you do it. Yeah? Very gently, very carefully. Yeah? You build up inner resilience. At the same time, you understand the problems of the external world. Thank you, Ajahn. 
Okay, um, so somebody's asking about the time it takes to get to stream entry. So there's some maths going on here. <laughs> so they're saying if we have seven lives maximum after stream entry, and let's say eight years each life, then it's about 560 years to the year 2600. What happens if in 2600 there's no more Earth and no more humans? And what about for humans that will take even longer to get to stream entry? <laughs> okay. Well, the, the thing is that there is always places to be reborn. Yeah, and if you don't get reborn in the human realm, you're going to get reborn somewhere else. So make sure you make some good karma so you get reborn in a good realm. Yeah, you don't want to be reborn as an animal or anything like that, a monkey in the jungle, if that's the, or whatever it is, then, because that's kind of uh, useless. Then. So uh, it's the same thing. Yeah, the, the idea, I don't, you know, I, I don't think that. It, human realm is going to disappear completely. I mean, who knows what's going to change with the, what's going to happen with climate change or whatever. It, it uh, you know, doesn't look very good, but uh, you know, this, I think it's quite likely we'll still be able to get reborn as a human, but maybe in a different way. Yeah, and maybe in a different kind of society, maybe civilization will collapse a little bit, but you know, it will still probably, I mean, that's a good thing that civilization collapses. Yeah, maybe we should think that's great. I mean. It's pretty hard to live as a monastic with the way the world is now. Yeah, it's pretty difficult. Isn't that right, Venerable Chanda? It's too much things going on and too many stuff. I mean, if we had a very simple world, we just had the local monastery, there was no internet, there were no telephones, there were just kind of the local village, and you didn't know about anything in the rest of the world. Yeah, and then you kind of had one little monastery connected to that village. Maybe that's good. Maybe that would be marvelous. Yeah, maybe we should kind of. Uh, Maybe we should sort of, um, you know, barrack for that. You know, we should, I know I'm just being silly, but it's not necessarily bad. That's my point. Yeah, we just don't know what is bad. It comes back to this beautiful idea of good, bad. Who knows what really is bad in the world? And so often we, I think, we focus on the wrong things. I mean, climate change is bad because it causes a lot of suffering in the world. But what is far, far worse is badness in the hearts of human beings, because badness in the hearts of human beings, that leads to real suffering in the long run, especially for those human beings. But if we, even if there is climate change, if we are wise about the climate change, if we understand and use that for our spiritual practice, it means that we're going to come out of the climate change in a positive way, because it means that in the long run, we are building up spiritual qualities. So even though climate change is bad, it also depends enormously on how we relate to it, relate to it in a good way, use it to understand the limits of the world around us. And actually, it encourages you on the spiritual path. And then it is a winning situation for that person. Yeah. So whatever happens in the future, whether the world is still here, whether there are, you know, the number of lifetimes, if you, if you are a stream man, but you can't be reborn in the human realm, then you will go to Devaloka. And if you can't go to this Devaloka, you go to another Devaloka. And if you can't be reborn as a human being in this solar system, you might get reborn in a different solar system, yeah? Maybe you get reborn as a green, little green woman or a little green man with antennas. In a, in a solar system far, far away? I don't know. <laughs> it is just possible, yeah? I don't think it is possible. I think they probably look like humans there as well. But there is endless possibilities. You don't have to worry about those things. I guarantee you there will be a place for you to be reborn and you will be able to practice the path in that way. So, uh, yeah, that is how I understand the, uh, the sutras. Lovely. So there's lots more questions, but I think if we can get maybe at least a couple more in, that would be great. Um, so someone's asking, is all craving bad? Isn't craving what leads to great achievements like scientific advances that improve people's quality of life? Isn't craving what has put us on the path and moves us forward? Yeah, that's a good point. Not, not all craving is necessarily bad because uh, you know, you know, there is no choice in the fact of having craving. Craving is part and parcel of what it means to be a human being. And you can't wish the craving away. We have to have some craving. It comes ultimately down to the sense of self. As long as you have a sense of self, you're going to have craving. So you have a very good point. And because craving is unavoidable, it is really about uh, like channeling the craving in the right way. And also um, uh, kind of... Um, 
um, what, what is the word I'm looking for? You know, uh, shaping the craving, you know, channeling and shaping it in such a way that it actually leads to something positive. Yeah, this is so important. And even craving in the sensual realm is going to be something real craving, yeah? and that's okay. So you just again try to first thing you do is to stay that keep that craving within the five precepts, yeah. And if you can keep the craving within the five precepts, you're already shaping the craving in the right direction. Then. And then you shape the craving more by having a commitment to kindness in your life. Yeah, That means, again, you are reducing the scope for the craving even more. So you are kind of narrowing down the scope for that craving. Yeah, And then you uh, even add a little bit of craving to the spiritual part. You think, yeah, I must be, I really want to be, Kind. I really want to have kind thoughts. Yeah, you have a bit of craving to be kind and to be generous. And that craving to be kind and generous is then going to transform into good actions on the Buddhist path. Yeah, so that kind of craving is good, just like certain attachments are preferable to others. So you're quite right. So it's a gradual transformation of the craving. Yeah, moving the day, gradually reducing the bad cravings moving on to more wholesome cravings. And as there's a kind of gradual shift in craving, eventually all craving stops entirely uh, all, all the way. When it comes to the craving and to, you know, building up, uh, you know, technology, etc. like technology has made the world a better place. It is true. Yeah, it is true that, you know, it has made the world a better place in many ways. Yeah, we have more medicines, we have more, doctors, we can do more things, uh, but uh, some of the technology is also bad, I think, especially when it comes to living a spiritual life, very uh, disruptive. So it, I think it is more marginal. And I don't think the craving that leads to a better world in that sense is really, is really what we need to, uh, it's not really helpful on the spiritual path. Yeah, I think if we're on the spiritual path, we should focus on the spiritual qualities. Uh, because those spiritual qualities are going to have far more impact for the greater happiness of humanity than any uh, technical solutions that we may find. Yeah? If you can be kind, if you can be a kinder person, it's going to have effects for so many people around the world. Yeah, It's going to be like the rings in the water spreading out to others. Uh, because when we see true kindness in the world, it's actually very inspiring. Yeah? We too tend to want to be kind when we see other people being kind. Uh, so that, I think, is a, is a much more profound and deeper kind of um, gift to the world and the gift that comes from uh, technology, which is brought about by craving and then building up these things. So, so don't throw away the spiritual path for uh, the technological path, yeah? because then I think we're getting things uh, the wrong way around. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, dear Ajahn, in the simile for the process of rebirth, where karma is the field, consciousness is the seed, and craving is the moisture, is it correct to assume that these three components, karma, consciousness, and craving, originate from the same set of five khandhas, from the same person? Please. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One uh, more? Yeah. It, oh. <laughs> Yeah, we can we can do more. I just uh, I don't know if I can should elaborate on that, but yes, it is the same. Person. So uh, the karma, the craving, these are all just aspects of one mind. This is a particular way of picturing those aspects of one mind. How the process then carries itself forward. So yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay, the next one's easy too. Um, why is afternoon the wrong time for eating? Why the afternoon is the wrong time to eat it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, no, it's just the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, it's something to do with Indian culture. Yeah, it was uh, you. Uh, I guess if you're going to have one meal a day, you would ha want to have it in the morning. And I, you know, otherwise you have to go hungry the whole day before you can have a meal. So you want to have it reasonably early, I suppose. And uh, that was the um, the general standard. The in ancient India was to have one meal a day, and sometimes monastics would have like. Uh, two meals, but very often one meal. If you're going to have one meal, you would have it in the morning. And I think it, it had probably something to do with the cooking in ancient India. There was a time when people would cook, they would cook something in the early morning, 
uh, for a particular meal, and that it was natural then to go Pindavan to receive food at that time. Uh, yeah, something like that, I think, is the, is the background for this. Uh, so uh, just a, a guess, really, but uh, yeah. Okay. Great. So I think we've still got five minutes, so maybe see what Actually, more we can... Yeah, yeah? great. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, dear Ajahn, is there something similar in the suttas to Ramana Maharshi's who am I method of questioning? Thank you. Aha, uh -huh. who am I? There is, uh, but in uh, Buddhism, it's the wrong question to ask, who am I? Because it is almost assuming and I in the first place. Yeah, you will notice who am I? It's kind of assuming that I exist, that there's something there to be found. But the Buddha, very interesting, and he says in the Sutta is that even the idea I am or I am that, there's another famous Advaita Vedanta book called I am that. Uh, the Buddha says that these things are misconceptions, yeah, they are proliferations of the mind, they are wrong ideas of the mind, even the very simple idea, I am, is a wrong idea, I am that, well that's certainly a wrong idea, I have a wrong idea, yeah, and who, who am I, would there so also be the wrong question to ask, and this is something I learned from Ajahn Brahm a long time ago, the right question to ask is actually, what do I take myself to be, because when you ask the question, what do I take myself to be, then you are making an inquiry into where the self-delusion resides. Yeah, the self-delusion must reside somewhere in the five khandas. And to be able to uncover that, you have to ask yourself this question, what do I take myself to be? And then when you, if you feel, if you try to feel, what, what is it that you take yourself to be? Yeah. And you will notice that maybe there are certain a certain perception of yourself, yeah, a certain feeling about who you are. And certain mornings you may get up on the bed, you may not feel like yourself. I don't feel like myself this morning. Yeah, then you have some idea what it is that you perceive to be yourself. Or very likely you identify with the doer. Yeah, I am the creator. I am the doer in my life. It's a very kind of natural thing to do. And in the ultimate analysis, almost all of us identify with the very fact of knowing, of being aware, of knowing that things are happening, yeah? The act of consciousness itself, of awareness in the world. So that is really the right question to ask in Buddhism, whereas the question, who, who am I, uh, that is already uh, really a, a biased question and coming, I think, slightly from the wrong place. Okay. Good. So we've got three minutes. So I'm kind of reluctant to bring in another question. What do you think, Ajay? Uh, yeah, another one. Perfect. Yeah. One more. Okay. One more to end. <laughs> okay. It's quite a big one, um, but who knows? Let's see how it goes. Dear Ajahn, I've heard you refer to Sati Sampajanya as preliminary, secular, or weak mindfulness. Is continuous situational awareness? of when going out and coming back, et cetera, as in Majjhima Nikaya number 10, the Satipatthana Sutta, a necessary precondition for deep meditation. In other words, are these the in-between practices that should be going on all day? Do they increase mindfulness and conserve energy by reducing papancha? Hmm. Okay, so this is a, a very interesting question and it's a very important one. And uh, I think, unfortunately, one of the problems is that it, to my mind, uh, this passage is often not translated very satisfactorily. I was going to try to get up the passage here um, because once I have it, I should be able to point out some of the problems with the traditional way of translating this. And I think even someone like Bhante Sudhaka, who uh, has done a very, generally speaking, a very good job with them, um, translating. I was not satisfied even with his translation in this particular case. I, I think he has got it not quite right. And I'm, well, I'm going to have to bring it up to him one of these days and, and see what he see what he says. But um, uh, uh, so now I'm going to go to the Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, I'm going to find this translation here. So you're right, this might take a little bit of time, but uh, uh, we shall get there eventually. Uh, okay, so situational awareness, Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, this is how it is translated by Bhattasujato. He has uh, 
Furthermore, a mendicant acts with situa away situational awareness when going out and coming back, when looking ahead and aside, when bending and extending the limbs, when bearing the outer robe, bowl and robes, when eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, when urinating and defecating, when walking, standing, sitting, sleeping, waking, speaking and keeping silent. So I, acting with situational awareness here, yeah, Sampajanya, and I think in this case, it actually just uses the word Sampajanya, not, uh, not Sati, not Sati Sampajanya. Um, it does not mean that you are continuously aware. Yeah, that, that's not really the point of this passage. The point of the passage rather is that you do these things in such a way that you are aware of whether they are leading to what you are trying to achieve. So to explain that, sorry, I'm getting a bit sidetracked because I wanted to look at the text at the same time. Yes, it just says Sampajana Kari, it doesn't say Sati, so just use the word Sampajana. Yeah. So the purpose here, according to the commentary, is that you are aware of whether those actions you are doing lead to the goal or not. Yeah, are you acting in a way that is consistent with the goal you are trying to achieve? And the goal you're trying to achieve is to move forward on the Buddhist path, is to be kind, is to have sense restraint, yeah, not to allow your mind to kind of uh, run out into the world too much, yeah. So the Sampajanya here is that you are aware when you are walking into the village and receiving alms, uh, you are aware that you are doing it for the right reason. When you're eating, you're eating for the right reason, you're eating to have enough food to sustain you, but not to eat too little, not to eat too much. When you're talking, you're talking for a particular purpose. You are aware of what you are saying and whether it fulfills that purpose that you are talking about. Yeah? This is the idea of Sampajanya. Is it fulfilling the purpose of the path? It doesn't mean continuous awareness necessarily. It means having these things at the back of your mind as guards that guard you from doing the wrong thing. Yeah? And that uh, this, the reason why this is mentioned in this way, in this particular passage, because this is about all of those things that happen outside of patient practice. So yes, ideally, we should all do this. Yeah? We should all have some idea of whether the things that we are doing are suitable or not for the goal. So if you want to be mindful, uh, what kind of entertainment are you enjoying? How much entertainment should you be enjoying? Should you be enjoying anything at all? Or, 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 or how do you do these kind of things? Uh, how often should you go to the casino? Uh, yeah, not too often. Yeah. <laughs> Who are the friends that we hang out with? Uh, yeah, all of these kind of things, they go into this idea of situational expressional awareness. Uh, because all of these things are then uh, the things that then set your mind in the right frame to enable you to practice the path yeah so that is really what situational awareness to my mind is about in the commentaries they're divided into four kinds of situational awareness the awareness of the uh, 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 awareness of the purpose of suitability of resort and of um, non-delusion i think yeah and of those two, it is really the first two ones that are important. Yeah? Awareness of the purpose and suitability of what you're doing. Is it going to lead you on the path or not? And if it is going to help, help you to head in the direct, right direction of the Buddhist path, well, then you know that you have the right Sampajanya. You have clarity about the things that you are doing in your life. That is really what it is about. So uh, does it have to be fulfilled? Well, as with all things on the Buddhist path, the more you fulfill it, uh, the more powerful it's going to be. Yeah? The better you do in these areas, uh, the more um, ability you'll have to practice the path, and the better results you will have as a consequence. Uh, but uh, complete fulfillment probably never really happens until you become a stream mentor or arahant or something. Yeah? In the meantime, we have to kind of be satisfied with the uh, uh, you know, 70% or 80% or whatever it is, uh, but at least we can kind of head in the right direction. I did say that I wasn't quite satisfied with um, Ajahn Sujato's translation here, because you will say, it says here that he acts with situ situational awareness when sleeping and waking. Yeah, and you cannot really act with situational awareness when you are sleeping. So the right translation there, in my mind, should be that you 
act with situa situational awareness in regard to sleep. Yeah, so you know how much sleep is appropriate. Yeah, how much is right, how much is too little. That would be the right translation. Both of those translations are possible from the Pali grammar. The grammar is a locative, a locative case, and that can be translated in both ways. And uh, I think that is uh, what should be, what is the right way of translating. And if you translate in that way, the passage reads like this, yeah? A mendicant acts with situational awareness in regard to going out and coming back, yeah? in regard to looking ahead and looking aside, yeah? in regard, etc. all the way, all the way through. So in other words, you, it is, you have an awareness of the action that you're doing rather than while you are doing it. And you can see how that makes the whole passage sound a little bit different. And I think that is the right way of translating it because it is the only way it really makes sense as far as I can see that. Anyway, okay, so uh, enough venerable. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, so, thank you. Shall we make great. sadhu to Ajahn Pamali? <laughs> Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> Great. Take care, everyone. Excellent. And Take we'll care, Ajahn. And we'll see you tomorrow. And uh, I'll just say a few words after you leave now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs> Great, so sorry about those whose questions we didn't come to. I'll see if I can drop in something along some of those lines this evening. Otherwise, please feel free to ask anything that's still on your mind to me tonight or to Ajahn Vimali again tomorrow. So, and uh, yeah, so now is your personal practice period or your non-self practice period, however you want to use it. So um, yeah, whatever position you decide to put these five candles in, just see if you can, um, learn how to relate to them in a skillful way so that we keep on increasing those wholesome qualities and undermining the qualities that lead to more suffering, more delusion, more confusion. And um, yeah, yesterday um, I gave you a few walking instructions. Um, I wonder if we might stop the recording